Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it is it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, especially because I got my professional start in the field of peace and nuclear disarmament at Physicians for Social Responsibility uh, back in uh, 1989. I'm still at it, um, and it's good to see so many people here who've been working on this uh, for so long and also to see a number of uh, newer faces here. Um, Ira uh, Helfen and I are going to try to provide an introduction to the uh, nuclear dangers that we face today, but also talk a bit about what we can do to move forward. Um, because uh, this is not a problem that uh, we can't solve, uh, as, I'll, as I'll describe. But first, I want to just remind us all about why we're talking about nuclear weapons. Because I, as I've found uh, in my work over the years, um, while many people of my generation and older understand very well what the effects of nuclear weapons are and why they're different from other weapons of war, um, younger generations don't quite understand. So I think in our work, uh, we need to understand that uh, nuclear weapons uh, have far greater um, impact because of their tremendous blast effects, the heat effects, uh, which, create, which incinerate and create enormous firestorms, um, the radiation effects, including atmospheric fallout that cause long-term uh, sickness, radiation sickness, cancer, uh, for months and, and years later. Uh, if used in large numbers, as in dozens or hundreds, uh, they would destroy uh, small or even large countries uh, and create uh, vast climate effects. And, and Dr. Helstone will probably talk about a little bit about, about that. Um, and the other thing that's important to remember is that nuclear weapons use, because they're indiscriminate, because of these uh, vast effects, uh, they violate international humanitarian law. And even though uh, the nuclear armed states might disagree with that, uh, that is a fact. And um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the importance of international law and the prohibition on, on nuclear weapons through the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons a little bit later uh, today. But of course, these problems are not new. Um, the problem of nuclear weapons has been around for a long time, uh, but the problem of nuclear weapons today um, has uh, come back with a vengeance, as, as Jean was, was saying. Um, the thing I want to remind everybody about is that uh, even though nuclear weapons have um, been around for a long time, we have uh, addressed uh, the problem through public pressure, campaigning, uh, governments have adopted policies that have uh, helped uh, reduce the threat of nuclear weapons over time. Uh, we have uh, established treaties that uh, limit uh, the number of nuclear weapons. Um, the, the cornerstone of global efforts to limit the spread of nuclear weapons and to bring about the elimination of nuclear weapons is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968, which is now 50 years old. Um, in the 1960s, at the time that the treaty was established, there were only four nuclear-armed countries, uh, and there were dozens of nuclear-capable nuclear states that were on the threshold of building nuclear weapons. But because of the treaty, uh, today we have only nine, which is still far too many. Uh, and these are those nine countries and the number of nuclear weapons they have. Um, North Korea, Russia, Pakistan, China, India, Israel, France, uh, the UK, and of course the United States. Uh, you'll also note that today, this is a rough estimate of the total numbers of nuclear weapons that exist today, the United States and Russia still have the vast majority of nuclear weapons, around 15,000 total. Uh, the United States and Russia still have about 90 percent, and the United States and Russia deploy uh, about 4,000 nuclear weapons each, and um, that's where we are today. Um, you'll notice that uh, while the other nuclear armed countries have far smaller arsenals, uh, it doesn't take a large number of nuclear weapons to wreak enormous havoc. Um, 
And so even though the arsenals of India, Pakistan, North Korea are much smaller, they can still wreak devastation, and there are new risks involving uh, those countries' nuclear weapons and the possibility of conflict between some of them today. Now, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty doesn't just bar the spread of nuclear weapons. It also requires that the nuclear armed states and other parties to the treaty pursue negotiations in good faith on, the, on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament. And so this obligation, which is in Article 6 of the treaty, has led the United States and Russia primarily to negotiate agreements beginning in 1972 that have at first capped and then later reduced the number of nuclear weapons. And that has been an important means of pressure on the nuclear armed states to reduce their enormous stockpiles, which amounted to about 25,000 nuclear weapons on each side. This is just the United States uh, nuclear arsenal over time. Uh, today, there are still two, two treaties that are still in effect. You'll see at the right side the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty and the 1987 INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. So these are the only two remaining <coughs> agreements in force that limit the United States and Russia's nuclear stockpiles. Now, the other thing to remember is that in addition to those treaties, we have other agreements that reduce the salience and, and have reduced the spread of nuclear weapons, including nuclear weapons free zone treaties that exist in Latin America, Africa, the South Pacific, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. And in 1996, the world's states came together to negotiate the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which bans all nuclear test explosions, which were the, the engine for the development of new and more deadly types of nuclear weapons. And today, even though that treaty has not entered into force formally, uh, 180 some states have signed the treaty, and every nuclear armed state, even North Korea, has stopped uh, nuclear testing. And then, very importantly, last year in 2017, some 120 states came together to negotiate a complete ban on the possession, development, transfer, use, and possession of nuclear weapons, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And that came about because of frustration with the fact that the nuclear armed states have not fulfilled the obligation in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, to end the arms race and pursue complete and total nuclear disarmament. So let's talk a little bit about today's nuclear dangers. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, this uh, little prop came along because it relates directly to this, uh, to this slide. Um, so one of the problems that we have today uh, is that uh, the United States and Russia still have uh, some 800 nuclear weapons on each side that can be launched by either President Trump or President Putin in a span of about 10 minutes. Um, what happens is one of the other presidents is presented with information that a launch has been detected from Russia. We believe it may arrive in about 20 to 25 minutes. Mr. President, you have a decision to make about whether to launch all of the United States available nuclear weapons. Uh, the President has probably two to three minutes to make this decision. He is presented with the nuclear football by a, an officer who follows the President all the time. President Putin has a similar scenario, similar setup. Um, and the existing U.S. nuclear strategy calls for a retaliatory response upon a notification of an attack upon the United States. Why? Because the United States strategy says that we need to be able to retaliate against whoever attacks us with nuclear weapons. And uh, if we don't immediately launch the land-based ballistic missiles that we have, we have about 400, we're going to lose them. And we won't, we, it will diminish our retaliatory capability. This is a monstrous and 
dangerous situation. There have been multiple occasions upon which there have been false alerts, and by good luck, sometimes by the intervention of a single individual, uh, neither President of Russia or President of the United States has hit the proverbial red button. So this is one of today's nuclear dangers, and um, the president, who shall not be named, uh, of course, has a more impulsive streak than past presidents. Uh, we should have been worried about this problem with in Obama, uh, W. Bush, um, but especially with the current president. Another problem that we have today is that we are now spending, and Russia is now spending, enormous amounts of money on recapitalizing the existing nuclear stockpile and the, the weapons that deliver, uh, or the, the, the delivery systems for those nuclear weapons. We're talking about a new fleet of submarine, uh, submarines that can launch uh, ballistic missiles. We're talking about uh, air-launched cruise missiles. We're talking about new long-range strategic bombers. We're talking about uh, an entire new fleet of land-based <coughs> intercontinental ballistic missiles, upgrades and extensions to existing uh, nuclear warheads. The total cost for this is estimated to be, over the next uh, 10 years, roughly, about $355 billion. But over 30 years, it's going to be in the vicinity of about $1.2 trillion, and that's before you take into account inflation. So that is um, an enormous amount of money. People at the Pentagon are themselves very concerned about these high costs because it's going to rob uh, from other defense programs. They've got to make some choices between guns and guns. And this is an unsustainable uh, kind of program. It's also unnecessary because the United States and Russia don't need to maintain 1,400 deployed nuclear weapons in order to deter the other side from launching nuclear attack. Now, another key problem uh, with the current situation, another key challenge, I'm going to go back to this slide about the reductions in U.S. and, and, and Russian nuclear arsenals, is the New START Treaty of 2010 and the INF Treaty of 1987 are in deep jeopardy. The new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty is going to expire on February 5, 2021, unless President Trump and President Putin agree to extend the treaty by a period of up to five years. This is a question that's up in the air. President Trump has said that, and his people have said, we're still evalu evaluating whether to extend it. President Putin has said, I want to begin talks on extending the treaty. Um, and if they don't do this, and the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty is terminated by President Trump as he has threatened because of a, uh, an allegation about a Russian violation of that treaty, we will have no legally binding limits on the world's two largest nuclear arsenals for the first time since 1972. So that is a severe problem because of one of the things I just mentioned, the ongoing programs to upgrade the US and the Russian nuclear arsenals. If there are no treaties to cap the arsenals, the costs could even go higher. And there would be, I'm quite sure, new proposals from the Dr. Strange laws in Washington and Moscow for new types of systems to deal with this uh, unregulated nuclear arms race that could be underway, including new land-based intermediate range missiles in Europe, which is what the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty prohibited. Now, we have another problem to mention, and then we we'll start getting to some solutions, which is North Korea. So these are a few comments from a year ago, the fall of 2017. We were quite close to a nuclear war with North Korea. North Korea had been for years pursuing development and testing of ballistic missiles. They had conducted up to that point five nuclear test explosions. They had a small nuclear arsenal and they were very close to being able to develop the capability to deliver nuclear weapons across the Pacific Ocean to hit targets in the United States. This was leading President Trump to 
threatened to totally destroy North Korea. <coughs> Threats of fire and fury. He was trying to put maximum pressure on North Korea through a sanctions regime uh, in order to bring them to the negotiating table. Got to the point where the Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was warning about World War III. Now, what happened? Luckily, the president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, used an opening created by the Olympics in February of 2018 to invite North Korea to come. That led to a North-South summit, which led to an invitation from Kim Jong-un to President Trump, and they met in Singapore. So the South Koreans, recognizing the dangers that were upon them, decided to take control of their destiny, create this opening, and we got this um, Singapore summit, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but my, my point here is that this risk of a conflict with North Korea is still there, even though there's now a dialogue going on. And if that dialogue does not produce some results soon, we could be back to a situation in which we have threats of fire and fury. So a few thoughts on how we can address these issues. Um, the first thing to remember is that we shouldn't sit here and get too depressed. We need to get out there and organize. This is an old bumper sticker that actually existed in 1982 that was on my mom and dad's car that I drove around in. So I believe in this bumper sticker slogan because it works. So um, the first set of things I would suggest that we think about as we go forward is what can we be doing to reduce the nuclear tensions that I talked about and reduce the role of nuclear weapons in US and other countries' foreign and military policies. So one of the things that's essential, it's basic, is that we need to think about how we can, as citizens, encourage our leaders to reaffirm the idea that nuclear war must, cannot be won and must never be fought. Uh, this is actually something that came out of Ronald Reagan's mouth. And in 1985, he and Mikhail Gorbachev, former president of the Soviet Union, uh, issued uh, this statement at a, at a summit conference. This is something that President Trump and President Putin could do when they meet later this month in Argentina or at some other time. Another thing we need to do is move away from launch under attack policies, which as I <coughs> described are exceedingly dangerous. We also need to, as the new Congress convenes, uh, think about ways in which we can encourage uh, the new Congress to eliminate the Trump administration's proposals for new and more usable nuclear weapons. So one of the, one of the, new, one of the new proposals in the Trump administration's budget plan is for new types of lower yield <laughs> nuclear weapons, including low yield nuclear warheads on the, the missiles that come out of the ballistic missile submarines. Um, now, if you're Russia and you see a strategic submarine launching a missile coming out of the Baltic Sea or the North Sea, uh, you're going to think that this is a, uh, a high-yield warhead that is the first part of a massive attack against you, and not a low-yield warhead intended for a low-intensity conflict in the Baltics. Mm -hmm. These kinds of weapons are designed to fight a quote-unquote limited nuclear war. And as most people will understand, once you start using nuclear weapons, uh, there is no guarantee that there will not be a retaliation from the other side and an escalation to a full-scale nuclear war. So this is a very dangerous kind of policy, a dangerous kind of weapon. So as I, as I was just saying, um, we have more nuclear weapons than we need for uh, deterrence. And um, we need to also remind our policymakers why do we have such a large nuclear arsenal? How can we reduce the, the costs? We also need to be thinking about how we can extend the life of New START. Uh, this is, as I said, a decision that President Trump and Putin are going to be making. Uh, how we can encourage other nuclear armed states to become involved in the nuclear disarmament process. We also need to be pushing uh, our policymakers to be pursuing and supporting smart diplomacy on denuclearization with North Korea. Now, as I said, there was the Singapore summit uh, in May of 2018. Since the meeting, the historic meeting between Trump and Putin and, and Kim, 
which I think was a very good idea. There has not been new progress on denuclearization and peace on the Korean Peninsula. What happened shortly after that summit was that North Korea stopped ballistic missile testing and nuclear testing, and the United States decided to stop military exercises with South Korea. That has helped create a good climate for negotiations, but the two sides have been at odds over who goes next. The United States is arguing that North Korea needs to take the next steps on denuclearization. They need to put forward a full uh, inventory of their nuclear and missile arsenal before the United States will uh, ease sanctions or agree to a uh, declaration on the end of the war. The North Koreans say, hey, we have exercised restraint. It's your turn to begin moving towards peace. So the two sides are at loggerheads. There has been no progress since May. There's going to be another summit, uh, likely in uh, the early winter of 2019. It's very important, in my view, that there is some progress through action for action steps, a little bit on each side, in order to move this process forward. And keep in mind, the denuclearization of North Korea is a long-term prospect. This is not going to happen in two years. It's not going to happen before the Trump presidency is over. It's a multi-year process, but we can and need to make some progress to advance the cause of denuclearization and ultimately a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. So finally, let me mention the importance of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, which Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defense, has said, and I think this is important, um, the new treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is an important step towards delegitimizing nuclear war as an acceptable risk of modern civilization. Other countries throughout the world are asking, and many people are asking, what is the United States and Russia? What is India and Pakistan? What is China and North Korea? What are they thinking about when they continue to pursue nuclear weapons and insist that these weapons are part of their, uh, essential to their security? And this treaty presents an alternative to the mindset that nuclear weapons are essential for um, security. And it is an argument that says nuclear weapons are actually illegal, immoral, and we need to move quickly to eliminate them. Now, the problem with the treating the prohibition of nuclear weapons, in my view, and maybe others will offer other views, is that it will not, in the short term, address some of those risks that I have described. The policies of the Trump administration, the costs of spending on nuclear weapons, the crisis with North Korea. But it is an important long-term, part of the long-term solution, and something that I think many people need to think about working into our uh, activism here in the United States. So I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts here from one of the co-winners of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Setsuko Thurlow, um, who said, and this is crucial, no one can solve this problem alone, but together we can change things for the better. And she said that in response to an interview from somebody who I think is very important for the future, my daughter, who interviewed her uh, last year as part of a school project. And Satsuko, being a very thoughtful survivor of Hiroshima, who was 13 when the bomb hit, had the wisdom to remind my kids that these are big problems, but we can do something about them. So let me stop there, and let me turn it over 